Yeah, that's one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible, and I want to make sure that some of you at least have the opportunity to hear what Paul is actually saying in that verse and the surrounding verses. We live in strange times. You don't need me to tell you that, but sometimes it's good just to hear another Christian admit it, because I'm still waiting for somebody in some church stand up and go, we're going to hell in a handbag, our country is, our world is. It's like we've fallen off the ledge. What in the world has happened? You know, at least show some sign that you get what's going on out there, because the rest of us do. These are not normal times. From drag queen story hour to you name it, uh, Target, Bud Light, North Face, just the tip of the iceberg of things that are happening. A month ago, if you don't think they're going to get worse, a month ago, the man who's credited as being the godfather of AI, forget his name, he worked at Google's division, I believe it's DeepMind, he walked away from it. I mean, he could have had his name attached to artificial intelligence much the same way that Thomas Edison had his name attached to electricity or Alexander Graham Bell had his name attached to telecommunications. He could have been incredibly famous, wealthy. He walked away from it. He said, I can no longer just tell myself at night, well, if I didn't do it, somebody else will. He walked away from it because he knows what's coming. And what's coming is a revolution that's going to make the Industrial Revolution look like a low-T event. Okay, just a, you know, a little bump in the road, a nothing. The artificial intelligence revolution is going to be something to see when it happens. And it's about to happen. You probably saw that Elon Musk and Steve Wozniak and several others in the industry penned a letter asking for everybody in the artificial intelligence research and development to stop for six months and let's, let's really think this through before we go one step further. But they didn't, and they're going on further with it. And what's coming is going to be spectacular, but not in the good way. So given all of that, you know, I want to lay my cards a little bit more on the table because I always have this dilemma. I've mentioned it in the past. If I come on here and tell you the supernatural element that's been part of this channel for the last two years, if I tell you God has been mightily involved, it makes me appear as if I think I'm somebody. It makes me appear as if I think I have a special anointment, anointing, anointment. Uh, it makes me seem like I have an inside track that you don't have. <clears throat> that is not true. So I don't want to float that out there, and that's just the natural way people would, would receive it. Oh, he really thinks he's something, doesn't he? But when I don't do it, I'm not giving God the glory he deserves. He deserves the glory, not me. I'm a bike messenger. I pick it up from him. I take it to you. And on the way, I'm reading it and going, well, I didn't know that. And I look in the Bible. That's true, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. So I want you to know God has been remarkably invested in this little channel for whatever reason. These are the kind of things he's doing. I noticed a couple of weeks ago, Christian conservative uh, commentator and filmmaker Dinesh D'Souza said he posted on Twitter that his Middle Eastern sources are all telling him that tons of Muslims are having dreams of Jesus and turning to him. Now, I knew that had been going on as of several years ago, but it's still going on. Our Lord is hard at work, and it includes this channel. It does not include me. It includes this channel channel for whatever purpose, well, wouldn't he have picked a much more important channel? You think so. I'm with you on that one. I can't figure it out, but I'm just going with it because I'm just the bike messenger. I'm picking it up and I'm delivering it to you as soon as I get it. 
and it has come faithfully now for two years. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, and then we'll get to the verse, because it's important too. When we got to the end of last year, it was around November or December, I finally put the sixth seal in the right place, and I saw how meaningful the Revelation 12 sign was. Oh my goodness, look at that. It is telling us something special. And I really thought this was going to conclude the lessons he was sending us, to know that the Revelation 12 sign is pointing us to the soon coming of our Lord and Savior. What an amazing revelation of how important the Revelation 12 sign was and is. And then at the beginning of this year, I suddenly had this urge to go to the Olivet Discourse. And I'm like, okay, are we moving on from Revelation to the Olivet Discourse? I'm fine with that, but is that what we're doing? And I was a little afraid, just a little bit, that what if we get to the Olivet Discourse and it doesn't line up with what he showed us in the book of Revelation? Ooh, that would bother me. A tiny bit afraid. But I've learned over the last two years, when he nudges me in that direction, go there. Be the bike messenger. You're you're not going to sit down and then, you know, let's commiserate, uh, Father, on this a little bit. Let's talk about it. No, you go. So I said, okay, here's what I'll do. I will read all three versions of the Olivet Discourse. Just re-familiarize myself with all of the nuances, all of the little minor details. Don't try to figure it out. Don't analyze anything. Just every day, read the Olivet Discourses, all three versions. And just wait. So day after day, for about a week, and then it hit. Boom. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. I knew that's it. That's what he wants me to see. Don't know what it means, but that's it. It's in all three versions, and it's every single time the event that takes place just before he shows up. So I thought, as this was going on, I thought, why did I so disregard that sentence And all the years that I've read the Olivet Discourse now, since 2007, December of 2007, how did I, how did I just disregard that? What did, why didn't I think that was important? Now I do, but what is it? Oh, look here. He's combining the stars falling from heaven with the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Okay, now we're getting somewhere because I had just learned that the stars falling from heaven were the angels who threw their lot in with Satan and were cast to earth. At the sixth seal, it talks about the stars falling from heaven like a fig tree casts its winter figs to the ground when hit by a mighty wind. The winter figs are a worthless crop. They never ripen. They never really become figs. They look like figs. They're no good. And that's how he's associating the angels who followed Satan. They get thrown to earth. And then it hit me. Oh, That's exactly what the Revelation 12 sign was pointing to. The powers of the heavens will be shaken is war in heaven. And the result of that war are the stars, the bad angels, being cast to earth with Satan. Now you could say, well, okay, that's kind of neat to know, but why is it such a big deal to you, Stan? Why is that such a big deal? Because what if you thought it was just, Cosmic eruptions just before the Lord appears. The Lord's still going to appear, whether it's war in heaven or cosmic eruptions. So what's the really big deal? Well, the really big deal about that is you can now go to the book of Revelation sent there by the Olivet Discourse to find out some unbelievable details about what's really going on. Because we learned that war in heaven will cast Satan and his angels to earth, but it's not to chain him. He is released for a short time. We are told by an angel, oh, it's good news for heaven. This is bad news for earth because Satan, he is earthbound and he's going forth because he knows he has a short time left. And then he goes forth and brings forth the beast, false prophet, all of that. What we can know from that is for certain the Olivet Discourse is not the second coming. If it were the second coming, Satan would be chained and the false prophet and the beast would be thrown into the lake of fire, but that doesn't happen at Christ's coming in the Olivet Discourse. It's well before that. 
It's not the second coming, but it is important because we also learn at that moment, the church goes from overcome to overcame. We are told in the letters, each letter to the church, overcome, overcome, overcome. The last letter, Jesus tells the church of Laodicea, you must overcome even as I overcame. And then he sends out the rider on the white horse to exact same Greek word, exact same Greek word, overcome. But at war in heaven, it overcame because all of these things are linked together. The bride's goal was to bring in a number, the full number of Gentiles. Paul talked about it. Jesus talked about it. The martyrs under the altar at seal five are told, wait a little longer. We're waiting for a number. There is not going to be war in heaven until the church hits that number. Once the church hits that number, Satan's services are no longer required in heaven. He has been allowed to wreak havoc against the bride. But once that number is hit and mission is accomplished, it's over. He is thrown out of heaven and the church is received into heaven and the final phase begins. And I know that's what he's been showing us and how important it is. Because if your eschatology is not a roadmap, to the hour of his coming, your eschatology is wrong. And I've explained that. When you see the results of war in heaven, in our skies, in our heavens, and men's hearts failing, and men passing out, and people running in panic, you are in the hour of his coming. That's why he says, when you see that happen, you look up. Don't go running. Don't go screaming. You stand up, arch your back, look up, because I'm there. That's what he said. But we don't know the day that's going to happen. The Revelation 12 sign, though, tells us, oh, it's coming, and you're the generation that's going to see it. That's how important it is to know that the powers of the heavens will be shaken is war in heaven. And the book of Revelation gives us mighty information about that event. But I feel like, uh, you know, I'm in some sort of bizarre Groundhog Day plot line, you know, where you're, you live the same day over and over. You get up, you're trying to correct something, and you fail. Wake up the next day, or let me try this. Fail. Wake up the next day, try this. Fail. Because that's what seems to be happening. The church isn't waking, waking up because I don't have the power to get that done. But even the people who watch me, about half of them think I'm a dumbass. Okay? They really do. They think I'm just talking out of my rear end to be crude. That's exactly what I get, no matter what I do. And that's why I want you to understand there's a supernatural component to this, because Stan ain't smart enough to figure this stuff out by himself, not by a long shot. And that's what I told him before this information started coming. And I think our agreement was, don't forget that, Stan. You have nothing to do with this. And I understand that loud and clear. And it's frustrating to see people not receive it. I mentioned Brad over at rev12daily.blogspot.com. Great site. But when you go into the comment section, most of those people think I'm a dumbass too because he's posted a couple of my videos on his website. It's amazing. And so I'm learning to control my anxiety and my frustration. It's not my job. My job is bring you what he brings me. Let's get to the verse. Behold, I tell you a mystery. One of the most misunderstood verses in the New Testament. Now, the people who misunderstand it, the few that will actually hear what, I'm, what I've got to say, will they change their mind? Don't count on it. That's been my experience. Don't count on it. Here's what I'm going to get from them. Oh, you're a dumbass if you think that. But... You, when you hear their line of reasoning about this verse, can know that they have it wrong. They are using this verse to justify not accepting what Jesus said at the Olivet Discourse. Here's how their line of thinking goes. Paul announces that he's going to reveal a mystery. And here's the next thing he says. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all will be changed. So he's revealing a new rapture. So 
In the Olivet Discourse, when Jesus says, I will send out my angels with the sound of a trumpet and I will gather all of the chosen, he's not talking about what Paul is talking about. Paul is revealing something new. So this is different than what Jesus is revealing. Therefore, what Jesus is revealing must be the second coming gathering, which we know can't be true because we know what the powers of the heavens will be shaken represents. But that's their, their thinking. They think that even though in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus says, hey, look, I've told you all things. They come back with, well, apparently not because Paul is revealing another special rapture. This is the hidden rapture. The one Jesus is showing, that's the one everybody sees happening. Paul is talking about a secret rapture. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, that is not what he is saying at all. Now, the Greek word, now I hear all kinds of pronunciations about this word. I'm going to pick one or two. Mousterion or mousterion. So it's one of the two, or maybe it's a common, I, okay, but that's close. Mousterion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. When you translate words from one language to another, you got to pick the best available word. For instance, when we translate shalom to peace, everybody who speaks Hebrew and is familiar with the Hebrew culture would go, yeah, that's not quite it. It's, I mean, it's okay. Peace is, yeah, it's in shalom, but there's a lot more to shalom than just peace. The same thing is true with this word. Mysterion. Yeah, but you say it with an accent, so I don't know if that's the right way I should say it or if that's just the way you say it in your language. Anyway, the closest a lot of translators thought they could come was mystery. A lot of people out there don't think that's the correct one. That should have been secret. As a matter of fact, Young's literal translation translates it as secret. Lo, I tell you a secret. But mystery, okay. It's, if you are thinking that Paul is talking about a mystery the way we understand mystery in the year 2023, you're never going to get what Paul is talking about. Strong's concordance gives a very good, I think, explanation of mousterion. Mousterion. Here it is. They start off by giving us the general Greek literature definition of that word. A mystery, secret, of which initiation is necessary. Now, that's not how Paul uses it. Fortunately, he uses the word multiple times, and you'll get a sense of how he is using it. He is not using it in the general sense of Greek literature. He has a specific use for that word, and Strong's understands that because the next thing they say is, in the New Testament, colon, so in the general Greek world, we get this, a mystery secret of which initiation is necessary. In the New Testament, however, it means the counsels of God, once hidden, but now revealed in the gospel or some fact thereof, the Christian revelation generally, particular truths or details of the Christian revelation. It's, you know, an unwieldy kind of definition, but it's a difficult word. I think if we said this, something that was kept secret until it was revealed by a revelation from God, something that you couldn't see unless he gave revelation to it. So some of you could say, okay, so what? So Paul's giving us a new revelation about a rapture. No. No, he is not. That is not what he is doing. So just so you understand, there are all kinds of mousterions. Uh, lawlessness, that was already built. God was not surprised by lawlessness. That was part of his plan. Hidden, Jesus Christ is a mousterion. All kinds of things Paul points to as being mousterions. Now let's look at the one here. Prior to this verse, he is talking about the difference between earthly things and spiritual things, or earthly forms and spiritual forms. He talks about that Adam was the first man earthly form. Jesus was the first spiritual form. This is that discussion where he talks about you take a seed, 
It doesn't look like an agricultural plant, but it's in there somewhere, and you plant it, and then it turns into a different form. And so he's comparing earthly forms with spiritual forms as he comes to this verse. Listen to what he says. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. See, what's happening here now after the discussion of earth form versus spiritual form, he says, we're stuck in earth form. We've got a problem. We're flesh and blood. We can't enter the kingdom of God that way. It's a imperishable spiritual place. We can't get there. So he's setting up the dilemma. No different than if a physics professor in college opened the class by saying, okay, We want to get this particle from point A to point B. Here's how we're going to do it. He starts writing out one of those complicated equations, and then he stops and goes, oh, no, I've run up against a law of the universe, and I can't get this particle to point B. This law of physics won't allow me to go any farther than this. So what are we going to do, class? What are we going to do? We're stuck. We're stymied. we got a problem. Class goes, I don't know. You're the expert. You're getting paid. And the professor goes, voila, I present Farnsworth's theorem number two. And he keeps writing and he shows how this mathematician came up with a workaround to not violate the universal principle, but get the particle from point A to point B. That's what Paul is doing here. He says, we've got a problem. We're flesh and blood and we're perishable and we need to be imperishable and spiritual. We've got a problem. That's when he says, behold, I tell you a mysterion. I tell you a secret that has been hidden, but is going to be revealed through Christ. He is about to pay homage to Christ. He is about to give glory to Christ. He isn't coming up with a new rapture. He has already talked about the rapture in previous earlier writings, most notably 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. This isn't about the rapture per se. It's about what Jesus accomplished. It involves the rapture that he's already discussed, and that rapture is the same gathering that we see at the Olivet Discourse. Listen to what Paul says. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Because we've got to get changed if we're going to get into the kingdom of God. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, just like it does at the Olivet Discourse, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed, those that are alive. So we are throwing off our perishable nature, and we've become imperishable at that moment. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the mysterion. How do we become imperishable How do we become immortal? We do it through the power and victory the Lord wrought at his death, burial, and resurrection. It's applied to us at the rapture. That's all Paul is saying. It's a mouthful, and it's important. He's not talking about, well, there's a special rapture. He's talking about that dilemma gets solved at the rapture he has previously written about in 1 and 2 Thessalonians. That's where you become immortal immortal. That's where you become imperishable. It's in full agreement with the Olivet Discourse. Did I just change your mind out there? No? What was that? No, you didn't, dumbass. Okay, well, I tried. That's all I can do. Anybody who is silly enough to turn away from the Olivet Discourse because it's giving you directions on what to watch for, If you don't, you'll get what I got this past week. Someone proud, arrogant. Oh, I'm not doing, I'm watching for the two witnesses in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Did he tell you to do that? No, he did not. 
He told you to watch for the signs in the heaven, and we saw that with the Revelation 12 sign. He is telling us, watch the oceans. It is about to distress the nations. And then when you see the powers of the heavens being shaken, you lift up your head because he is at the door. You are within the hour of his coming. Those are his orders. Anyone who doesn't follow his orders will have him come upon them as a thief. And I don't know what that means, but I know this, it's easily avoidable.